Introduction to Harindranath Chattopadhyay, Part 2. This is an article by James H. Cousins on Harindranath. You know that the little book that came into Sri Aurobindo's hands, written by James Cousins, meant a great deal to Sri Aurobindo because he was able to read, even though the book was quite small, but many of the new poets and comment on them. So James H. Cousins has written also on Harindranath, and I quote, I have written in my book, The Renaissance of India, of the problem presented by the poetry of Harindranath Chattopadhyay in its exquisite and most desirable importation of oriental vision and magic to poetry in the Eng English language and in its consequent menace to India's literary and national future in the possible drawing away of other young poets from their true instrument of expression, their mother tongue. This book, his first, with its lyrical morning joy and bird-like assurance on the wing, accentuates that menace, and yet almost simultaneously with the declaration of opinion mentioned above, and with glaring inconsistency, I hear unblushingly, nay, with pride, introduce the dangerous young poet. The poet within myself rises above the jungles and swamps of the mind to some quiet hilltop on which he makes salutation to a comrade born with new and compelling vision and utterance, which are all, after all, that really matter to the soul of humanity in its, in its hunger and thirst for articulation. A thousand gold bags of a Persian king are equal balanced with a grain of sand. Our poet of 19 years sings sagely in a poem, not in this book. And it may be that in the scales of art, the weight of much predilection and a great many theories of human relationship will be found light in comparison with the grain of genius. We plan out our political systems. We expound our schemes of education. We talk of the vernacular as the safeguard of national spirit. With the examples before us of Ireland preserving and uttering her soul through centuries of foreign speech and Wales in her own ancient tongue, swearing away her soul to the foreigner. Examples which do not make us change our opinion as to the national necessity of vernacular expression. Then comes some individual bearing the sacred fire of genius and its white flame makes our apparently shining dome of many-colored glass look like variations of the primal darkness. We are forced to recognize that our plans and arguments are only props to weakness, stimuli to derivativeness, signs of disease through which humanity is slowly progressing towards health. 
They are certainly not evidences of activity of the free spirit, which shows itself through individual genius rising above the level of a race or an age and uttering itself in any tongue it pleases to use. It has done so in the case of Sarojini Naidu. It is doing so in the case of her young brother, the author of this book. And literary history has now to record the fact that the wind of the spirit can blow with equal strength simultaneously from two points of the compass. Arindranath Chattopadhyay is, I am convinced, a true bearer of the fire, not the hectic and transient blaze of youthfulness, which has its place and time, and only a place and time, but the incorruptible and inextinguishable flame of the immortal youth which sustains the world's visible and invisible. In that conviction, I find refuge from inconsistency. James H. Cousins. We follow with praise from many. First, from Sri Aurobindo. Here, perhaps, are the beginnings of a supreme utterance of the Indian soul in the rhythms of the English tongue. The genius, power, newness of this poetry is evident. We may well hope to find in him a supreme singer of the vision of God in nature and life and the meeting of the divine and the human, which must be at first the most vivifying and liberating part of India's message to a humanity that is now touched everywhere by a growing will for the spiritualizing of the earth existence. And this <clears throat> from Rabindranath Tagore. I feel sure you have all the resources of a poet in lavish measure. One marvels while reading Haran's poetry. Storm clouds of intoxicated richness whirl and wander, borne by strange whirlwinds all night and day, and out of them, cleaving through their collected glooms, golden sunrises appear suddenly and spread from end to end. Translated from the Bengali. And here is something from A.E., whose poetry we have read previously in our editions of Seeking the New Poetry. You have the root of poetry in you. I can see that your poetry has changed in its character and your mind and imagination probably as the result of the great spirit. This was in a letter to the author, dated 25th May, 1935. And from Alice Maynell. It is exceedingly interesting to me to see such a meeting of Eastern and Western imagination as I think your poetry brings about. Again, from Lawrence Binion. Your verse will find its way because it is truly 
poetical. I think your command of English is wonderful. And from Padraic Colum, all the poems in the book are delightful. And it is amazing to me that you, coming out of another tradition, have been able to get such spontaneous verse forms in English. Again from Harold Child. You do not need now to be told that your use of English is really remarkable and that you make of it a live language to which you add something of your own which perhaps no Englishman born could contribute. Works like yours is specially refreshing and cheering at a time when very much English poetry is confined to a rather harsh and defiant materialism. I keep opening the book anew and always light on something beautiful and deep. And again, from James H. Cousins. This young Indian poet shows the way at the beginning of this century out of the deep valleys of gloom and uncertainty into the sunlight and elevation of inner realism of divinity from Fowler Wright. Perhaps the time may come when miners of a distant day will search amidst the dross of the early part of this century and find some disregarded lyric gold. And it is in such circumstances that the work of Harindranath Chattopadhyay will be assured of the recognition that it deserves but has scarcely reached today. And what Conard did in English prose, it may be high praise, and yet not too high, to say that Chattopadhyay is doing in English poetry today. No one of any soundness of literary judgment can read his work, whether in lyric or dramatic form, without recognizing that it shows an unusual mastery of English verse forms, and yet that it is something other than imitation, English poetry. The Quarterly Review of London wrote, we are able to congratulate Mr. Chattabadye on the facility which he uses the English language his aim as a poet is rightly ambitious, and the joy with which he sings of the infinite is indeed praiseworthy. Now, in searching for days and weeks through pages and pages of the internet, I found this article entitled Towards a Poetic Vision. The author is uncredited, but deserves to be included in my retrospective of Harindranath Chattopadhyay and his poetry, with a special reference to Sri Aurobindo's comments. When a journalist inquired of Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore towards the end of his life. Sir, after you, who? The Vishwakavi replied at once, my mantle falls on Harindranath. While reviewing Harindranath's maiden book of poetry, The Feast of Youth, in Arya, 1918, the prophetic, poetic genius of India, Sri Aurobindo Ghosh, admires the spontaneous ease, power, and beauty of Harindranath's muse, 
and comments on the nature of the young poet's poetry. Sri Aurobindo, a rich and finely lavish command of language, a firm possession of his metrical instrument, an almost blinding gleam and glitter of the wealth of imagination and fancy, a stream of unfailingly poetic thought and image, and a high, though as yet uncertain, pitch of expression are the powers with which the young poet starts. About the rarest boons Harindranath is blessed with, the globally celebrated sage poet continues to proclaim in Arya, quote, He is rather overburdened with the favors of the goddess. Comes like some Vedic Marut with golden weapons, golden ornaments, car of gold, throwing in front of him continual lightnings of thought in the midst of a shining rain of fancies. A richly gifted poet of high quality, artist, playwright, actor, essayist, story writer, painter, pioneer in stagecraft, freedom fighter, patriot, and an orator, Harindranath Chattopadhyay was a myriad splendid genius like Rabindranath Tagore and his many achievements like the hues of a rainbow are amazingly variegated and dazzling. He also dabbled in politics and was a communist member of parliament from 1952 to 1957 and represented the Vijayawada constituency of Andhra Pradesh. Harindranath was raised in a profound literary and cultural environment, along with highly gifted brothers and sisters like Sarojini Naidu the celebrated Indian English poet, in a loving home. No wonder, under the influence of his spiritual and highly cultured father, warm and affectionate mother, and in the company of his literary and intellectual brothers and sisters, Harindranath nurtured deep love for poetry and began writing poetry in English at the very tender age of eight and blossomed into a young, promising poet. Born to noble parents, into a well-cultured family, and brought up in cosmopolitan environment, Harindranath acquired pleasant traits like intense and venerable love of life, human sympathy, liberal outlook, keen sense of color, love of song and silence and deep faith in the divine. And all these traits helped him to blossom into a great poetic personality. About his joyous childhood that shaped him into such a great poetic personality with noble traits, Harindranath writes in his autobiography, quote, Childhood, as it is beautiful and merry as ours was, thanks to an understanding home and parents whose sole ambition was to make us grow up into joyous fullness of life and vision, such childhood is one long and unbroken holiday." End quote. Harindranath is certainly an authentic voice, and there is nothing artificial or false 
either in his feelings or in his reflections, which invariably spring out of the depths of his inspired heart. Spontaneity and authenticity can be experienced in the inspired poetic utterance of Harinyanath. A. N. Duvedi remarks about the poetry of Harinyanath, quote, his poetry is rich in thought and is sometimes illuminated by flashes from the hidden glory within, end quote. The poet displays wonderful poetic freedom, vigor, and great variety in form and content. As to Harindranath's contribution to Indian English poetry, the critic P. C. Kotoki opines, quote, the only Indo-English poet to make a deep probe into Indian life and thought. His main contribution to Indo-English poetry lies in widening its field and enriching its store with a considerable number of fine poems. The major themes in his poetry, God, the highest self, life and death, nature, the child, poetry, and poet's personality, Contemporary issues and events are of eternal value. He dwells on these repeatedly and ceaselessly. So this scholar has chosen to embark on the exploration of the major themes of Harindra Chaturbhadya with a view to unveiling the myriad visions of the poet illumining the poetry of this most ignored, great Indian-English poet, and with the objective of bringing to blazing light the eternal beauties and the immense poetic potentialities of Harindranath that lie hidden in the womb of oblivion. Now, we come to the recollections of some Ashramites concerning Harin. Amal Kiran K. D. Setna told me and my wife, Mary Helen, that Harin wrote one lakh, that's 100,000 lines of poetry in one year. After he left the ashram, he no longer had Sri Aurobindo's guidance and presence informing him with the muse of poetry. And again I quote that Amal said when Harin returned some years later and Amal showed him the poetry he had written, he had written in the ashram, Harin wept. Temi who was a fine poet in her own right, was one of the best English teachers the ashram has ever had. Her poetry was praised by Sri Aurobindo. Temi told me the following, that mother would come out on the balcony, the, the terrace, the one over Nirodbaran's room, and throw baskets of flowers to Harin. After receiving the flowers, he would go directly to his room and type poem after poem on his typewriter. Temi said, Mother put the force in him through the flowers. Now we begin with many of the comments of Sri Aurobindo on Harin. In the new publication of the collected works of Sri Aurobindo, uh, 
a book entitled Letters on Poetry and Art. Contains many new letters of Sri Aurobindo that I had never read before. And I have included these in this section of Harindranath Chattopadhyay Introduction, Part 3. 